Good morning, and welcome to the retirement and assumption of office ceremony in honor of Rear Admiral Jason Lloyd. Please rise for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the presentation of colors, our national anthem, and the invocation. Bosun, post the side boys. Rear Admiral, United States Navy, arriving. Rear Admiral, United States Navy, arriving. Vice Admiral, United States Navy, retired, arriving. Naval Sea Systems Command, arriving. Advance the colors.
Retire the colors. Join me in prayer. Our Lord, creator and sustainer of everything, we stand in awe of the beauty around us on this day of ceremony for the change of office and retirement ceremony in honor of Admiral Lloyd and Admiral Small. I stand here speaking for all of us in this invocation as we appeal for wisdom and perseverance for Admiral Small, who will continue the duties of this office. We also express thanksgiving for Admiral Jason Lloyd for the sacrifice and service for over three decades. As Ecclesiastes 3 says, there's a season and time for every matter under heaven. This is a time to reflect and to celebrate as this family transitions into their next phase of life. Be with us today in our Lord's name. Amen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Vice Admiral James Downey. Hey, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Joe. Um, good to see you over there, Austin. We have most of the carrier family together. That's that's really great to see. I'll pause for Jason's presidential flyover here. <laughs> and uh, please uh, join me uh, in thanking our band, our color guard, the drill team, who performed so well, and to all our sailors, officers, civilians who made these ceremonies so memorable. Please join me in a round of applause. And a very special welcome to our guest speaker, former uh, NAVC Commander Vice Admiral Tom Moore, uh, who we've all served with and for. Uh, and a warm welcome. I'm not sure, I think I see everybody here. Retired uh, former commanders and then some active. Uh, Admiral uh, Bill Galinas, Paul Sullivan, um, our former PMD Dave Johnson. I think I see Tom Anderson with us today as well. I apologize if I'm missing folks. So. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. Also, uh, welcome our former NAVC executive directors. Yao, is Yao here? There she is, with her amazing energy. Jim Spurchansky and Bill DeLine. There we go. Great to see you. As well as former CO5 uh, alumnus, uh, Emil Eccles, I think, is here, right? And Jim Kenny and I'm probably missing a bunch of folks. Thank you very much for being here. Most importantly, a sincere welcome to all of the family and friends and personal guests of Rear Admiral Jason Lloyd in our Navy's, I'm pausing for a second, our Navy's newest flag officer, Rear Admiral Pete Small. The, uh, that ceremony just preceded this, and it's great to have him in the war room. Here with uh, Rear Admiral Lloyd, I believe are two Mrs. Lloyds uh, today, uh, Jason's mother Kay and his wife uh, Dulcie and their sons Chris and James. Jason's sister Lisa is here this morning, as are Jason's nephews Jack and Michael. Welcome to all the Lloyd family members joining us today. We're happy to have you here to share this big day with Jason. 
I shared with him in this morning, uh, over his entire tour as the chief engineer for the Navy, he made one great decision, and that was to do this outside today. Um, <laughs> one technically correct decision. But that, my point on that, my view on that was about two to three hours ago. So anyway, I, uh, we will be uh, conscious of where we are today. We're glad to see uh, Pete's family here as well. His father is here. Uh, Commander Ken Small, U.S. Navy retired. His mom, Carol, Stacy, his wife, is here, as are their daughters, Clara and Elena. His sister, Pamela, and his brother-in-law, Chris, are also here. Please join me in welcoming the families. I'll go a little bit off script here uh, and ask you to join me in a moment of silence. Um, we. Uh, in this, in this carrier family, in this Newport News focused family, we lost, lost a uh, shipmate over the weekend. Um, Commander Chris Eagle, in a uh, really tragic accident, left, uh, left his wife, uh, Caitlin, and uh, his uh, kids, five and seven, uh, Kai and Ophelia. So please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. You know, seeing the families present here today and in our thoughts, it certainly reminds us of how central you are to our successes. Uh, our success professionally, our success uh, defending the nation, our, dis our success uh, partnering with our allies in our Navy mission. Our Navy family sacrificed so much over the course of their, their loved ones' careers, moves, separations, contending with the unknown, of course. It is the job of those who wear the uniform to deter, defend, and defeat. And that difficult, very difficult job uh, would be all impossible without all of you. So thank you very much. The retirement uh, of any officer with a record like that of uh, today's honoree is cause for both celebration and reflection. Very soon we will uh, execute a time-honored tradition, the tra transition of command from one naval officer to another. With that, we will also honor Admiral Jason Lloyd as he concludes nearly four decades of superb service to our nation's flag and our Navy. 38 years in total, 33 as an officer. I learned today he joined the Navy one week before me in uh, 1986. So you're, you've got a bit on me there, Jason, but not much. Uh, let me say that there are not too many things that would compel me to, this week, I should start over. This week is the 82nd anniversary of the Battle of Midway, and today we are recognizing the 80th anniversary of the landing at uh, Normandy, which I was traveling with the SECNAV and the CNO. But I canceled out because this is certainly more important, Jason's, uh, Jason's ceremony and Pete's recognition. I would not have missed this chance, uh, of course, to pay public tribute to both of you and the incredible work that has been done in CO5 and all that you'll carry on, Pete. Our Navy is charged with project, projecting power in peace, power in war, and assured access at all times. We do that by translating warfighting requirements into combat capability. The engineering rigor and the technical authority behind that tremendous effort, everything from unmanned to nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers, is predicated on the work of our CO5 team, the Chief Engineers Team for the Navy. This team represents a massive portfolio of great importance. It is great to see such a turnout today from the team and certainly a testament to Jason's leadership. Despite the size of this Navy, we frequently run into old friends and colleagues, Simon, uh, again, over the course of our careers. And for me and Jason, it's been about two decades uh, on and off here, uh, serving as we worked in uh, many common spaces together, uh, starting back in PO Carriers more than 20 years ago. We were colleagues several more times over the years, with our final collaboration being that one that concludes today, uh, recognizing Jason as the NAVC Chief Engineer and Commander. Um, Jason has always been an asset, and for three reasons. 
experience, expertise, and character. I'll first start with experience. How many reactor officers can say, how many current reactor officers can say they served on a nuclear cruiser, the USS Bainbridge? A ship whose keel was laid when Dwight Eisenhower was president. That is kind of old Navy, Jason. <laughs> During his career, Jason also served aboard Nimitz and had deployments in the Med and the North Atlantic. Ashore, he served as Deputy Project Superintendent at Norfolk Naval Shipyard, Maintenance Coordinator at Naval Air Forces, Principal Assistant Program Manager, and later Program Manager's Representative for PO Aircraft Carriers. A multi tens of billion dollar portfolio. All of these experiences culminated in really the ultimate job, serving with Oscar over here. Jason served as the first reactor officer on the USS Gerald R. Ford. Ashore, Jason also served as executive assistant to a certain nav C, commanding officer of Supership Newport News, and finally, nav C05, the Navy's chief engineer. Jason's collection of experiences uniquely prepared him to lead and have enabled the second reason he has been such an asset, his expertise. Not everyone can masterfully translate experience into expertise, but Jason's accomplishments as our Chang, our chief engineer, reveal a master of master at work. Jason's advanced additive manufacturing uh, efforts throughout the, the fleet and the PEOs, reducing maintenance delays and keeping more ships submarines and carriers mission ready. He, he personally furthered our cold spray efforts that are going on right now on USS Boxer to repair our, the rudder issues and steering system issues that we're dealing with. He was the force behind our, behind our condition-based maintenance initiative, imposing new efficiencies into maintenance availabilities, keeping, as the CNO would say, or producing more players on the field. He introduced, as I mentioned, cold spray to the fleet, re revolutionizing the Navy's welding needs and practices, saving time and, and uh, with cost efficiencies. He led his CO5 team in many technical adjudications, resulting again in more mission-ready surface ships, submarines, and nuclear aircraft carriers. One of his greatest contributions was his talent for team building. He built and led his team of engineers and logisticians, along with Tom here, who is great. Uh, we couldn't think of a better partner, uh, Jason, right? Uh, to getting to yes, uh, getting to yes mindset. Throughout the fleet and the PEOs and ensured that they, will all, that they always found an engineering solution that balanced the different types of risks to keep our Navy as mission capable as possible, not a minder minor undertaking. Good team building reflects good leadership, and Jason is nothing if not an outstanding leader. The predicate for leadership is the third reason he has been such an asset, his character. The character of our Navy is predicated on honor, courage, and commitment. Three words that rest on things unsaid. Grit, integrity, conviction, accountability, collaboration, generosity, generosity and more. If you talk to Jason, he will tell you it all boils down to just take care of your people. And he demonstrates that every day. For as long as we've worked together, we have certainly engaged in our shared challenges, I'll say. Uh, always arguing through what is technically right. But I've always admired Jason's character and ability to engage in these tough decisions. I have no doubt that our Navy is much stronger today as a result, Jason, of your leadership and commitment to upholding our Navy ideals. And so, Jason, it's our, as our professional relationship somewhat closes today, thank you for nearly four decades of service to our sailors, our Navy, and our nation. I am extremely proud to have known and served with you. I am proud to have worked with you so many times over the years. I wish you and your wonderful family uh, health and happiness uh, in, a, in a very bright future. Please join me in a round of applause. As I surrender the microphone on this warm uh, June day, let me welcome 
the officer who will be so who will soon be charged with fixing uh, and addressing some of our Navy's most complex challenges. Certainly in service and even more enduring in new construction. Grandma Pete Small, and uh, as a native of New Jersey, Pete was commissioned at the University of Virginia with a bachelor's in mechanical engineering. And since then, he has also acquired an advanced, advanced engineering degrees from MIT and Columbia. And I'm not, I'm referring to the university, not his time on the Columbia program. Although you'll earn a few degrees there. Pete earned his dolphins aboard SSN 686, the El Mendel Rivers, before taking on and teaching duties at the Naval Science, uh, in Naval Science at the State University of New York and Fordham's NRTC program. His next stop was Stuttgart, Germany, supporting the management of military engineering uh, with headquarters U.S. Uh, European Command. As an engineering duty officer, Pete has collected broad experience working on unmanned submarines and ships, their design and construction. His experience in the construction and repair of manned submarines, Los Angeles and Virginia classes, was acquired at private shipyards and at our supervisor shipbuilding. He has also served in a wide variety of design manager and project officer duties, include construction manager for the Columbia class submarine program, project officer for AUKUS, nuclear powered submarine consultation period. And Pete, allow me to welcome you to your new duties as NAVC's chief engineer. Again, a little bit off script, but Pete, the, the fleet commanders are gonna ask, what do you recommend? And they're not simply looking for a list of technical options. They're looking for what do you recommend we do? And that's what I'm gonna be looking to you and Tom for. Pete, the dolphins you wear, as well as your experience in engineering and design, unmanned technologies, academia, shipyards, both public and private, and time underway, make you the clear choice as the officer to lead our challenges ahead. I have no doubt our team is in great hands with you and Tom at the helm, and I look forward to getting after it with you. Congratulations, gentlemen. Excellent job, and congratulations on your promotion. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Rear Admiral Jason M. Lloyd. Thank you for coming. Uh, I know it's a hot day. Apologize. Um, uh, special thank you to uh, Shannon Turgeon for the blessing and uh, Navy Band and the uh, flag detail for the uh, phenomenal rendition of the National Anthem. Admiral Downey, thanks for agreeing to be my retirement officer. Admiral Moore, thank you for agreeing to be the guest speaker. A huge shout out to Lieutenant Commander Penley, Amber, Ringo, Pat, Alonzo, and all of my friends and sailors that agreed to be a part of this ceremony. Vice Admiral Moore, Vice Admiral Downey, Vice Admiral Sullivan, Vice Admiral Galenis, Vice Admiral Johnson, Mr. Miller, Ms. Fan, Mr. Smertansky, and Mr. DeLine, fellow flag officers, members of the Senior Executive Service, and all of the great Americans out here today. Thank you all for coming to spend this morning with us here at the Historic Washington Navy Yard. Tradition holds that comments made by the incoming leader are typically three minutes or less. A few people. I stuck to my three minutes when I relieved as a commanding officer of Super Shooting Import News. By the time that I was relieved as the outgoing commander and it was my turn to speak, COVID was in full effect. And I didn't get to speak to very many people at all. It was me and Oscar and like five other people, I think, right? Um, when I came here, there were seven people at my change of office because COVID was still in full effect. So I didn't get to speak again. Now is my chance to talk. <laughs> if you paid for parking by the meter, you can go ahead and feed it now. Get comfortable. My position here at NAVC, serving as the chief engineer, has been 
the most rewarding experience I could dream of. I've worked for four NAVC commanders. I think that's a record. Three NAVC executive directors, and alongside two flag officers from every PEO here except one, Tom Anderson, you outlasted me. I won't call out many names besides the leaders of the teams that I'm going to discuss today, because in doing so, I will inadvertently leave somebody off. But you know, you know part of where, where you were and part of our wins. For the change of office comments, I'll focus on the NAVC team that has been by my side for the last four years. I'll address some of the casualties that were solved and some of the lives that were saved. More importantly, I'll address the changes that were made in order to prepare for the Davidson window and continue to make Xi Jinping wake up and say, not today. When I assumed the duties of Chief Engineer in May 2020, we were in the bouts of COVID. Chief of Naval Operations asked NAVC-05, the engineering team, to form a Naval COVID Rapid Response Team to get after ultraviolet light technologies to destroy the virus, proximity tracking capabilities, health monitoring, blood transfusion and storage capabilities, and many other technologies to prevent sickness and save lives. Led by Doug Arnold, Doug Vauders, Tim Barnard, the NCR2T delivered technology solutions to save lives. It was an honor and a privilege to work with such heroes. It seems the Navy Chief Engineer, each Navy Chief Engineer has specific casualties that define what they'll do over their time in their tour as NAVC-05. Some of the ones that come to mind, some of my predecessors, the USS George Washington Fire and USS Miami Fire, Admiral Office. Um, the collisions of John F. McCain and the USS Fitzgerald, Admiral Selby. My tour was no different, although Pete claims he's gonna break the tradition. When I took this position, my family was still in Hampton Roads while our youngest finished high school. Our youngest is the Marine out here. Um, two months into my tour, I was sitting at our kitchen island with Dulcie having coffee on Sunday morning, 12 July, 2020. I received a phone call from Eric Duncan. He reported there had been a fire on the USS Von Homer Shard and the fire was out. I turned on the news and saw smoke billowing from the hangar bay of Von Homer Shard. Almost immediately, Eric called back and said, uh, that was a bad report, the fire's not out. Eric, uh, for, for the next four days, we manned the NAVC Incident Response Center around the clock and fought the fire, moving water to maintain stability, supplied all information the crew needed to safely bring the casualty under control and put a fire out four days later. Although a horrible tragedy, the fact that no one was killed or seriously injured while fighting a fire with temperatures greater than 1200 degrees Fahrenheit is testimony to the firefighting principles and trainings that are driven from NAVC-05 requirements in NSTM 555. Eric Duncan, Kerry Filling, Hank Kuzma, Mark Latner, Doug Arnold, Jim Kinney, as well as the entire NAVC 05 P, Z, and D teams. Although we could never prove it, I am absolutely positive the work you do every day in maintaining firefighting standards um, and fighting the ship uh, saved lives on the ship that week. The expert advice you gave him tactics and strategy, as well as stability control over a four day period, saved lives. The spouses, parents, and children of the loved ones on the ship that day don't know who you are, but we do. The Navy and Nation are forever in your debt. Fast forward. Thank you. Fast forward a year later, a year and change. On the morning of 2 October 2021, I was again having coffee on a Saturday morning uh, when I received a phone call from Will Noll, a lifelong friend from Naval Reactors. I can hear his voice like it was yesterday. We have a Sea Wolf class submarine that has hit something underwater at a high rate of speed near the South China Sea. She is on the surface being trailed by a Chinese trawler and is looking for shallow water, presumably because the commanding officer thought there was significant risk that the submarine was going down. We immediately manned the Submarine Technical Information Center for the next few days. We worked the ship to effect emergency repairs necessary to get the boat to Guam temporary repairs and long range planning. Over the next few months, the NAVC team led the Navy to develop temporary repair plans to get the boat back to Puget Sound where we could effect more permanent repairs. Kirk Craig, Eric Duncan, Mark Latner, Doug Arnold, Captain Bishop, along with the entire CO5 U, P and Z teams and the rest of our submarine team. Although we could never prove it, I am absolutely certain 
the work you do every day in both sub robust submarine design and certification in the subsafe program saved lives that day. Quite possibly every life on that ship. We lost no one. We lost no one and escaped with 11 minor injuries from a very high speed undersea crash with what turned out to be an undersea mountain. Your actions over the next few days to stabilize the boat and get her home quite possibly save more lives or save their lives again. The spouses, parents, and children of the loved ones on the ship that day don't know who you are, but we do. The Navy and the nation are forever in your debt. These casualties would form the backdrop for everything we were to accomplish over the next four years. Transition more technical decision and risk making to the waterfront and drive the adoption of new technologies as Admiral Downey referred to, such as additive manufacturing, condition-based maintenance plus, cold spray, mechanically attached fittings to support our challenged defense industrial base. We realized these isolated casualties pushed the NAVC and industry team to the limits and we knew in a wartime scenario we would not be able to support the fleet as needed with the current peacetime mentality, casualty control, and manufacturing processes. We had to form a more cohesive team with our PEOs, our type commanders, our fleet partners, and the capability of the defense industrial base to push more technical authority and risk decision making to the waterfront and to adopt new technologies for construction and repair. From here came our mantra, assume noble intent and one team, one fight. On the rudder changes we affected over the last four years, I'm beyond humbled by what the Navy engineering team has accomplished. Over the first year, we held several strategy sessions for our leadership team to map out the transformation we knew was necessary. Over this four year period, you established the leadership of language that I have been taught by many stellar leaders over my career. Assume noble intent, Jim Smirchansky. If you don't like change, you're gonna like irrelevance even less. Tom Moore. I added my own too. The only time you're ever allowed to say they is if you're talking about China or Russia. Otherwise, it is we and our PEOs, shipyards, the fleet, and industrial partners, one team, one fight. Eric Lynn, Tammy Barr, Victoria Levi, John Brand, Chris Lighty, Aaron Babick, and Commander Penley stepped up to help you get the transition of the message to the rest of the NAVC engineering team around the world. The NAVC extended family has become a well-oiled machine over the last four years. Most importantly, you embraced and recognize the need to change in order to keep up with our adversaries. This is the most difficult, most substantial, and most rewarding mentality shift that had to be made. Thank you for accompanying me on this journey. I could go on all day long about monumental changes you have made, but I'll just hit the wave tops. You established cold spray as a normal, reliable, effective repair process. As Admiral Downey referred to, we're using it right now to get Boxer back in the fight. We use cold spray to prevent a Virginia-class submarine from having to spend five months in dock. It took us eight days to fix it. We established mechanically attached fittings as an alternative for construction and repair for pipe fitting. Using masks is eight times faster than brazing or welding and results in no hot work, a practice that all too often results in fires in our shipyard availabilities. Along with Matt Sermon and Whitney Jones and the submarine industrial base, you transitioned defense additive manufacturing from a concept to a reality. We now have metal additive manufacturing capability on our large deck amphibs and aircraft carriers. This will make our forces much more self-sufficient to mitigate supply chain vulnerabilities, both now and in the high-end fight. You worked hand-in-hand -hand with the Virginia Ship Repair Association to streamline welding processes to repair ships at a reduced cost and improved speed. Thanks to our partner at Visra, my dear friend, Bill Crow. You transitioned condition-based maintenance to reality on over 20 Arleigh Burke destroyers. Here we're using shipboard sensors, artificial intelligence, machine learning to accurately predict machinery failures before they happen and make repairs. We now predict machinery failure on DVGs much like your Tesla does for you in your car. And finally, you established the first system to accurately track and retire risks and you team with the PEOs to help them understand what their technical risk is with the limited dollars they have to go execute their programs. Jim Kenny, Tom Parati, you're the most phenomenal civilian leaders that I've ever had the opportunity to serve with. 
Thank you for your mentorship, for always having my back. Thank you for the endless synergy you put into the Navy and the nation. And most importantly, thank you for your friendship. The United States Navy has no idea how lucky we are to have your leadership. For our NFC flag officers and SESs, thank you for taking, giving me the honor to be part of the world's greatest organization during this most challenging time in our nation. For the entire NFC industrial base team, our nation needs us more than ever to team together. I'm beyond honored to have worked with names such as Rebel Seiko Akano, Rebel Tom Anderson, Rebel Bill Green, Rebel John Rucker, Rebel Todd Weeks, Rebel Eric Perhey, Rebel Julie Trainer, and Rebel Diana Wilson. I rest at ease knowing these leaders will support you, Admiral Young, as you take your MC further into the Davidson window. Thank you for the following industry leaders that continue to partner with the Navy to rebuild the defense industrial base that our nation has to have. Those represented here, Newport News Shipbuilding, Electric Boat, McKenzie, Mantec, Fairbanks Morris, Caterpillar, 3M, L3 Harris, Sigma Defense, tying it all together, Kid Looney, thanks for being here from uh, American Society of Naval Engineers. The Naval Engineering Workforce and Defense Manufacturing Industry allowed us to overmatch our adversaries to win World War I and World War II. It will take that same strength and teamwork to rebuild the industrial base to prevent World War III and to fight and win if required. I'll leave you with five final, final thoughts that I always leave my team with. If you don't like change, you're gonna like irrelevant even less. Assume noble intent. The only time you're allowed to say they is if you're talking about China or Russia. We have a mission. One team, one fight, go Navy, beat China. I will now read my orders. When directed by reporting senior, detached from deputy, duty as deputy commander for ship design, integration, and engineering, CO5, Naval Sea Systems Command, and transfer to the retired list in the grade of rear arm. Please rise. Captain Clopper, hold on my flag. Aye, aye, sir. Hold down Rear Admiral Lloyd's flag. Yes, please be seated. Rear Admiral Lloyd will now be presented his personal flag.
Ladies and gentlemen, Rear Admiral Peter D. Small, United States Navy. I will now read my orders. CNO Order 0964, when directed by reporting senior, report in May 2024 for duty as Deputy Commander for Ship Design, Integration, and Engineering, CO5, Naval Sea Systems Command. Please rise. Break my flag. Aye, aye, sir. Break Rear Admiral Small's flag. Guests, please be seated. Sir, I relieve you. Stand in the room. Admiral Downey, how have you relieved as your Naval Sea Systems Command Chief Engineer? Sir, I have assumed the duty of the Naval Sea Systems Command Chief Engineer. Ladies and gentlemen, Rear Admiral Peter D. Small, United States Navy, Chief Engineer and Deputy Commander, Naval Sea Systems Command, Engineering and Logis Logistics. Thank you, Vice Admiral Downey and Vice Admiral Moore for hosting us here today. All the distinguished flag officers, senior executives, industry partners, colleagues, thank you for attending this amazing ceremony. Thank you to Admiral Lloyd for your 33 years of dedicated service and your friendship and hospitality during our transition. Thank you to my family and friends for attending here today. I'm going to keep the personal remarks shorter because I understand the three minute challenge and also I had the pleasure of pinning on the rank of Rear Admiral in a separate ceremony with many of you just prior to this. There I had the opportunity to reflect on my own 29 years of service and the great honor it is to continue to serve the Navy and our nation as a flag officer. The Cliff's Notes version of that earlier speech is that I'm extremely fortunate to have my wife Stacy, daughters Clara and Elena, sister Pam and brother-in-law Chris, parents Ken and Carol Small, in-laws Jody and Ryan Delaney, and my nephew and nieces John, Egan, and Maggie all here supporting me today and every day. I wouldn't be here today without your love and support, and I love you all. In your brochure, you'll find a short history of the chief engineer, or Chang, and a list of those who have held this position going back to the Civil War era. I find myself in a category with historical giants like Benjamin Isherwood and Samuel Robinson, and the titans of my own engineering duty officer career like Sullivan, McCoy, and Eccles is a breathtaking and awe-inspiring experience. I am both honored and ready to accept this challenge. In a previous assignment, I had assured Stacy that I had the best job in the world and that I would periodically ask her to remind me of that fact. Well, Stacy, I didn't have it quite right then because now I have the best job in the world and I'm pretty sure I might increasingly need you to remind me of that fact periodically. <laughs> Given this tremendous opportunity to lead the Engineering and Logistics Directorate of the Naval Sea Systems Command, 
the preeminent world-class engineering organization for warships and submarines. I reflected on the strategic challenges of the organization, both in the context of its historical foundations and the current operational environment. I'm not a history buff per se, but I think a firm understanding of the first principles and lessons learned from the past are essential for future success. Those lessons must be applied in the context of a Navy and nation that are continually evolving and today would be unrecognizable to those esteemed leaders from our history. In a previous assignment, Admiral Casey Moten and I often discussed the parallels between the interwar period of introduction of naval aviation with our own efforts to field a fleet of autonomous vessels to today's Navy. And for the past two years, I've been on a campaign to highlight the challenges of designing our first new attack submarine in the 30 years since the end of the Cold War and the cancellation of the Seawolf program, given that everything, repeat, everything has changed about our national security posture, national industrial capacity, technology, demographics, and workforce. About now, some of you are worried that I'm not gonna hit the three minute limit. Uh, indeed, the first draft of this speech was headed for a lengthy and academic comparison between Amal Rickover's 1974 speech aptly titled The Role of Engineering in the Navy and uh, the CNO Frank Hetty's vision for America's warfighting Navy. But given the time constraints and it's hot, I'm going to summarize. With, res with regards to warfighting, CNO Frank Hetty charges us to deliver decisive combat power and view everything we do through a warfighting lens. As a balance, however, Admiral Rickover famously states that technical problems are a matter of detail. The devil is in the details. On warfighters, the CNO charges us to use the principles of mission command, take initiative and bold action with confidence. But Admiral Rickover reminds us that nearly all decisions in the Navy today deal with engineering problems. Technology will not stand still. The penalty for technological surprise can be enormous, even fatal. On foundation, the CNO states that we will earn and reinforce the confidence of the American people every day and that we will align when we, we will align what we do ashore with the warfighting needs of the fleet. Amal Rickover cautions that reform means progress, progress means strife. Where there is no friction, there is no motion. I'm highlighting these quotes not as, a, not as contrasting perspectives. Each is relevant and valuable and needs to balance the other. In fact, while composing these remarks, I entertained a thought, experience, a thought experiment where Admirals Frank Hetty and Rickover were getting along famously working together to drive our Navy forward. That scenario might be a bit of a stretch, but there are things they absolutely would agree on. Both provide nearly verbatim declarations of the Navy's purpose to defend our nation and win decisively in war. They would also agree on the urgency of action required. Over the past several weeks, I've had the pleasure to sit with the NAVC-05 Directorate, meet the staff, and see them in action. I am absolutely confident that this organization is ready and willing to respond to the CNO's call to action while remaining grounded in technical excellence. Indeed, they are already well down this path as described by Admiral Lloyd and led by himself and Mr. Tom Parati. In the remarks earlier this morning, I recounted how I received a phone call on Friday, January 5th, notifying me that I've been selected for promotion and the following Tuesday, I received my first direct email from the CNO. Coincidentally, that email was promulgating her America's Warfighting Navy. And the text of that email directed me that there is no time to waste. We must think, act, and operate differently to create and sustain warfighting advantages in a rapidly changing security advice environment. You will lead this charge, her emphasis. I'm ready to go to work. Thank you for attending. This concludes the change of office portion of the ceremony. We now celebrate Rear Admiral Jason Lloyd's retirement. Well, sir, you didn't think that uh, I was going to pass up the mic opportunity to talk about something. All right. Um, I want to take a couple minutes to tell you about uh, how Admiral Lloyd has personally changed my life. And I'm going to try to do it without looking at Dulcie or my wife or Hannah or Emily, because I'm going to make a scene and I'll embarrass myself. All right. So I first met Admiral Lloyd in 2009 during my engineering duty officer qualification tour at Supervisor Shipbuilding in Newport News. Then Commander Lloyd, as program manager representative for RCOH, and I, a lieutenant at the time, 
with one of his assistant project superintendents for the CBN 71 RCOH. I'll be honest, at that time in my life, I didn't know if a full Navy career was for me. And I hadn't fully applied myself in the past. I had tried to a few times, but I usually seemed to create a bigger mess than I started with. So I was content with being in the middle of the pack instead of leading from the front. The best analogy I can make is that I was kind of like a Labrador retriever. Labs are generally good dogs, but with proper training they can be great. They are intelligent, hardworking, loyal, and can be trained to perform very complex tasks. They can be expert hunting dogs, therapy dogs, sniff out explosives from EFD, and even be a seeing eye dog, able to guide others through the physical hazards of life. Yet, if untrained and left to their own devices, you will inevitably come home after work to a dog that will greet you at the door, wagging his tail, and proudly show you the furniture he chewed up in the holes he dug in your backyard. That was me in a nutshell. Well-intentioned, hardworking, with lots of unrealized potential. Luckily, Admiral Lloyd saw my potential and invested himself in my development. He not only took the time to teach me engineering duty officer basics, he also afforded me the opportunity to apply what I was learning to solve real problems on my project. Problems that if I failed would reflect poorly upon him. He was willing to take professional risks in order to develop my abilities. He moved me up in the organization until eventually I was acting PMR as a lieutenant commander for the last six months of my tour, following his transfer, where I learned a lot. While I admired the professional development I was being afforded, the most extraordinary thing to me was how much interest he took in mentoring me outside of work. Whether it was financial planning, family planning, or how to dig myself out of whatever hole I had put myself in with my life. He, always, he was always there, providing me much needed advice, even if I didn't ask for it. Not only did he take interest in my family's life, but his wife thought he did too. She has always made me feel like, made me and my family feel like an extension of hers, and has always been there to give advice to my wife through the years as I advance in rank and I'm and I'm not unique in that regard. He and Dulcie have been integral parts of the lives of dozens of other military families and naval careers. I've never worked for a leader that takes so much interest in developing the whole person and the whole family. As a young J.O., I was absolutely blown away by all this and quickly went all in with the Navy and engineering duty officer as a career. I don't remember the date, sir, but I remember the conversation where I made my all-in decision. I had just selected lieutenant commander, and as we walked from building two to another grueling CO agenda on CBN 71, I asked him for advice on how to handle the transition to lieutenant commander. He stopped and said, I'm not interested in how good lieutenant commander can be. I'm interested in how good Captain Clothar can be. I realized I had a senior officer in my corner that truly believed and cared about me, the entire me, not just work me. Following his PMR tour at suit ship, and despite pushback from naval reactors due to my poor technical rating, Admiral Lloyd took me with him to be his main propulsion assistant while he was the first reactor officer on Gerald Ford during new construction. I supported him while we navigated the trials and tribulations of standing up a reactor, part, reactor apartment on a new class and completely new plant design. At times, there was immense pressure on him to hold schedule despite not having proper logistical support for system turnovers or proper consideration for ship's force testing preparation and rest requirements. He always held the line, but in doing so, he also worked with our shipyard and NAVC partners to figure out innovative, efficient, and mostly an overall safe ways to meet requirements while supporting his schedule. What amazed me most about the way he developed the department's requirements for success was his focus on the sailors. Every decision was focused on how it served the sailor, from paperwork to training to maintenance to test program conduct. It all focused on the sailors. No decision was made in a vacuum, and none were made without the input of his assistant reactor officer, his PAs, and above all else, the guidance of the chief staff. This was a completely different approach than I had experienced for my dinner tour, and one that has become the foundation of my own personal leadership style. 
The last thing I'll mention that I learned on that tour was the importance of the subordinate to superior closed door conversation. It didn't happen that often, but there were times after a heated end of days meeting where uh, the PAs, normally RCA or RMO, would turn to me and say, you got to go talk to her. After the appropriate cooling off period, I knock on his door, ask to enter, and after I close the door behind me, he'd say something like, uh-oh, what do you got? The valuable part of the conversation, though, was that not only would he listen, but sometimes he actually changed his mind. It made us a team, a team that knew everyone's opinion mattered. But at the end of the day, we knew who the boss was, and we were enthusiastic about enforcing his orders, even if we didn't necessarily agree with them at the time. I will add that he was almost always right when he disagreed. <laughs> uh, while those were the only two tours that I had the pleasure of working directly for Admiral Lloyd, I've been able to enjoy a career's worth of friendship and mentoring. He's been instrumental in helping me ensure the perfect overlap of personal and professional goals and has shown me how to lead the right way. The way that takes care of our most precious, precious resource, our sailors and government civilians. I really just wanted an opportunity to say thank you from the bottom of my heart, sir. Thank you for believing in me and thank you for investing the time to enable my tra tradition, my transition from a Labrador digging holes in the backyard to one train like a seeing eye dog, able to lead sailors and officers, blinded by youth, through the trials and tribulations of life and service to our country, just like you did for me. Thanks. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Vice Admiral, retired Tom Moore. Hey, good morning, everybody. Joe, thanks for those kind remarks. I will have to say I'm a little disappointed. He said that Captain Lloyd was almost always right. And, you know, I think Chase would probably tell you it hadn't worked for me. I was always right. So. <laughs> <laughs> Admiral Downey, Admiral Galinas, Admiral Sullivan, Admiral Johnson, Admiral Eccles, Ms. Fan, Mr. Fuchansky, Mr. Delay, Mr. Miller, Mr. Parati, and Mr. Kennedy from CO5, flag officers and members of the Senior Executive Service, past and present, uh, my Nazi family, distinguished guests, the Floyd, Floyd family in particular, and friends. Uh, what a great turnout to celebrate the outstanding career of Admiral Jason Lloyd, one of the Navy's great leaders over the past 30 years. It is a veritable who's who of the carrier and CO5 community here today. And these are just, there are just too many of you to name individually. Heck, even the chaplain was a former CVN chief engineer and supervisor of shipbuilding. So, Shannon, it's great to have you here today. Now, having attended many of these events over the years, we tend to measure the value or importance of the honoree by counting the number of flag officers and SCSs in attendance, including the most senior officer present. And there are a large number of you here today. But the reality of it is that in many cases, the senior leaders have to be there or don't really know the individual that well. To me, if you want to get a truer measure of the impact the individual had throughout their career, look at the number of their peers or the number of people that have worked for them that show up. And as I look out over the crowd today, it's pretty clear that Jason had a significant and positive impact on many of you. That above all else, above all the individual accomplishments, will be the true legacy of a great leader, and that is Jason Lloyd. Jason, I am honored and humbled that you invited me to be your guest speaker today and I'll do my best to try and give the audience my bird's eye view of your career over the past 25 years, sprinkled in with a few stories from the usual suspects, all of which I can personally attest are at least partially true. <laughs> I've also known you and Dulcie for the mo most of the past 25 years, and I've watched your sons grow into amazing young men of character just like their father. And I've watched you grow from a division officer on USS Nimitz during the maiden RCUH in 1998 working for Jim Chapman by the way, for those of you accounting at home, we completed that RCUH in 38 months. All the way to being the Navy's chief engineer. And Jason, just as I said to Yao a few months back, I can say without a doubt that I would not have made it as far in my career if that I did without all the great work that you did along the way. Now, before I go any further, I want to talk a little bit more about Jason's family because they are such an integral part of who he is. Jason's youngest son, James, is a corporal in the United States Marine Corps. Raise your hand, where are you, James? Yeah, hoorah. And he's stationed at Cherry Point as a community tech. 
Thank you for your service. Station at Cherry Point is a communication specialist. I got a chance to meet James and many members of his team last fall during a barbecue at Jason's place, and let me tell you, they can eat a mess of barbecue. <laughs> and the Marine Corps is in really, really good hands. Jason's oldest son, Chris, is a VMI graduate. Chris, where are you? Yeah, thanks for being here. And if you don't know, Chris was an exceptional runner growing up, running a 5K, 3.1 miles in 15 minutes. That's a sub five minute mile pace for those of you who are trying to do the math. Chris is a real estate broker in the Hampton Road area and once worked for a new producer, but in as a supply chain manager. Welcome, welcome to both of you. And now on to Dulcie. Now, knowing how squared away and studious Jason is, it won't surprise anyone here that Jason and Dulcie first met at the bank. Uh, in fact, when Jason told me that, I thought to myself, well, that makes sense. Jason has been managing budgets his whole life. Until I remembered how many times he would come to my office when he worked for me when he was PMS 312E and tell me that he just couldn't get done what I asked him to do because he didn't have any more money. Now, the funny thing about this is Tom Parati mentioned that one of the things that Jason used to talk about all the time in 05 was priority setting, and he used to use me as an example. And according to Jason, Jason would walk in and I would give him tasks, and, and Jason would say, well, I got X number of things on my plate. Which of these things would you not want me to do? <laughs> and so Tom asked me, well, is that true? Well, as you can imagine, my recollection is slightly different than Jason's. <laughs> I would politely remind him that he got about $250 million a year in budget and ask him if everything else he was funding was off a higher priority than what I wanted him to do. And when he said no, I told him, well, there you go, get going. <laughs> so anyway, back to Jason and Dulcie meeting at the bank. As it turns out, he wasn't talking about that type of bank. He was talking about a country and western bar named The Bank with a Q. And almost 30 years later, they are still one of the greatest couples I know. I've never seen two people enjoy all the various mandatory fun events we as flag officers have to attend in DC as much as they do. Whether it's the Navy Ball, the EDO Ball, Top Gun Night at the Navy Memorial, they're always there and they always have a good time. And I have to tell you that the two of them could really cut the rug on the dance floor. So if you were thinking that it was Jason's brains and good lucks that attracted Dulcie, think again. It was actually his moves on the dance floor. <laughs> All kidding aside, Dulcie is an exceptional woman. Not only has she raised two wonderful sons and supported Jason's career, but today she is also an Arlington lady, making sure that our veterans who have answered the final call and their families are honored as they are laid to rest for the final time. Dulcie, thank for you for all you've done for Jason and for the Navy these many, many years. How about a round of applause? So let's talk a little bit about Jason. Now, for those of you who know me, I'm an optimistic and outgoing person, but have you ever met anyone in your life more positive and outgoing than Jason? For those of you that know him, what is Jason's standard response when you ask him, how's it going? Anybody? Fantastic. It was infectious, and I love being around him. The other thing I learned from Jason was that when he would send a note to someone, he would almost always start the note with, I greatly appreciate, as in, I greatly appreciated your time, or I greatly appreciated your ideas. You get the point. I was so struck by that that I immediately started doing that with all my emails and still do to this day. Try it sometimes, it's pretty good. Now you can read his bio that he enlisted in the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program in 1986 prior to attending Florida State. Sorry, I got that right. And that his first ship tour was on USS Bainbridge. What you can't tell from reading the bio is that one of his first CEOs was Captain Jim Brown, whose son, happens to be Rare Admiral Scott Brown, who is NAV CO4 today. So it is a small world indeed. Jason then went on to USS Nimitz as a division officer during her refueling complex overhaul at Newport News Shipbuilding, starting a long and distinguished association with the shipyard. It was here that he made the first of several career mistakes, all of which have for fortunately worked out well for him. When he was leaving Nimitz, all Dulcie wanted was for Jason to stay in Norfolk, which is where Airland and a lot of the EDOs go. Unfortunately, when the detailer said he had a TICOM job for Jason, Jason said great, but he forgot to ask which one. And before he knew it, they were headed to San Diego to the Commander Naval Air Force Pacific. This was, fortuitously, however, an important first step on the path to us meeting. Now, no story about Jason's career would be complete without including Captain Peggy McCluskey. Fortunately, she and her husband Bobby are on a planned vacation this week and could not make it. 
but hopefully they are watching the live stream. For those of you who don't know her, Peggy was the first female CBN chief engineer on U.S. at Theodore Roosevelt back in 2000. She was a great and forceful leader who to this day is a wonderful friend to both of us. She blazed the trail for many of our future women leaders in the EDO community, including Rear Admiral Diana Wolfson and Captain Hannah Crewell. Welcome to both of you, by the way. After Peggy left TR, she became the first woman to be the force maintenance officer at Combat Air Force, and Jason ended up working for her. Unfortunately, Jason's initial meeting with her did not go well. For those of you who don't know, Jason is a devoted cyclist and has also been a triathlete at various times. And with cycling comes crashes, some minor, some with lots of road rash. The weekend before Jason's first day at work at Air Force, he went cycling, had a bottle of some sort and got some nasty road rash on his legs. He thought he had it adequately bandaged, so of course, wanting to make a good impression on his first day with the captain, he wore his expensive gabardine khakis. And of course, his bandages did not work as expected, and his pants were spotted in blood, enough to be noticed by the most casual of observers. He caught all kinds of hell from the rumpus room, which was an eclectic collection of ship maintenance coordinators and some legendary names in the carrier maintenance world like John Bentley, Glenn Parrish, and Frank Burke. Now, as Peggy tells the story, she would not even have noticed, given that Jason is short. By the way, that's the first reference to Jason being short in the entire day. I admit it. The over and under on that was a lot less than that. And uh, she was sitting behind her desk, so she could not see his legs, or even when she stood up to shake his hand because she was looking him in the eye. But Jason uh, rushed directly into an apology, causing Peggy to look down and see the blood all over his pants. He didn't realize that Peggy's new, now husband Bobby was an avid cyclist and that she was used to this. Peggy ended up giving Jason some tips to get the blood stains out of his pants as she had not yet become fast friends with Dulcie who would have known how to take care of the matter. And as Peggy tells it, he probably got an earful when he got home. <laughs> It was sometime after this event that Peggy introduced the two of us, which began our 25-year relationship. At the time, I was looking for a new assistant program manager for in-service carriers, and so I asked Peggy if she knew anyone that would be good for the job. A brief editorial comment, I had been PMS 312V from 1999 to 2001, and you really never want to have the job that your boss previously had. Peggy says, I've got the absolute person, perfect person for the job. His name is Jason Boyd. It was also about this time that Dulcie had finally gotten over the disappointment of leaving Norfolk and now was loving San Diego and, of course, wanted to stay. Peggy tells Jason that this is a career-enhancing job and to give me a call. Jason calls to ask me at the job and the interview goes really well, so much so that I offer him the job on the spot, to which Jason makes his second detailing mistake and says, great, when do you need me there? And since he asked, I said, how about three weeks? Jason then had to go home and tell Dulcie that not only won't they won't be staying in San Diego for the three years they originally planned, but that he would be leaving in three weeks, leaving her behind and heading to DC while she got the kids through school, packed up and moved the family to Washington. At this point, I'm sure I was not on Dulcie's list of favorite people, as she said in her head. And at that point, she'd never even met me. So Jason packed his bags and moved to DC as a geo bachelor the first of three times I asked him to do that. And he did a great job, as you would expect, and I knew then that he was destined for great things. After he finished the 312B, he finally got to go back to Norfolk, where he was assigned to Soup Ship Newport News, where in the course of three years, he was both Code 50, 152, and 151, managing the refueling overhaul and new construction programs. The Code 151 job was also the perfect stepping stone to his next job when he was selected by Naval Reactors to be the pre-commissioning reactor officer on USS Joel Ford. Now, being selected for any pre-commissioning crew is always special, but being selected for the pre-commissioning crew of the first new CBN design in 50 years says the world about Jason. And Jason dove into the job with his usual enthusiasm and work ethic. Now, we all know that all first of class ships are hard, and Ford was no exception, and I know Brian Antonio and Jim Downing will agree with me on that, but Jason took his crew and trained them and led them on, the, on this first of class design. Jason's work laid the groundwork for an exceptional propulsion and reactor plant to perform flawlessly on the ship's first deployment. The Ford class will be in service until, get this, 2110, if you can imagine that, and generations to come will benefit from the exceptional work Jason and his team did during that period. Jason's next job was as my first executive assistant at NAVC. I called Jason as soon as he became NAV, as I became NAVC and told him that when he finished on Ford, he would be coming back to DC for a year as my EA and then compete to go back to Shoopship Newport News. So at least in this case, 
I got a semi pass from Dulcie for making J Jason be a geo bachelor for the second time. Once Jason settled into the seat as the EA, he brought his usual energy and focus to the front office staff, who I know thoroughly enjoyed working for him. In fact, two of my former aides, Aaron Sheckman and Will Day, and two of the executive officers, Will, uh, Jim Delon and, and uh, excuse me, <laughs> Bill Delon and Jim Smirchansky, are here today to honor Jason, if that gives you any sense of the impact that Jason made. And I want to publicly credit Jason for one thing that most people don't know about. Because I was new, we were working to update both the NAFC mission and vision statements. We had coined the term, the force behind the fleet, but we were still looking for a vision statement that would be as simpler to remember, would challenge the workforce and describe a future state. And we were noodling in the front office one afternoon with a drawing that then CNO John Richardson had built that showed that the capability gap and warfighting advantage between us and China was closing. And the CNO's focus was on stopping and reversing that trend. After a lengthy discussion, Jason looks up and says, Hey, what about expand the advantage? We all looked at him and said, ah, that's it. And when I went over to discuss it with the CNO at my next sink, he loved it. And so that's where expand the advantage came from. And eight years later, at least until Jim changes, <laughs> decides to change it, it remains the NAFC vision statement. Now, after a little more year than a year in the front office, EA with, uh, Jason was chosen to go to Super Super Newport News. And we've had many great supervisors over the year, but you can make a compelling case uh, that based on his background and the job he did while he was there, that he may have been the best supervisor shipbuilder in the history of Shoop Ship Newport News. And he's certainly in the top three. And that's saying a lot given the long, rich history of outstanding supervisors continuing through Hannah Crewall today. Jason was a great leader there and challenged everything and was never satisfied with the status quo, always looking for ways to make things better. And as a supervisor, the highlight of his tour had to be the chance to sign the letter accepting delivery of the USS GRR Ford the ship he had worked so hard on as a reactor officer. After a hugely successful tour at Super Chip New Produce, Jason was selected for flag in 2019. I'm not sure who was more excited, him or me. When I called him to discuss his next assignment, I didn't even bother asking before I said he was coming back to DC for a third time to be the FC 04 behind, 05 behind Lauren Selby. This was a challenging time as Jason outlined right at the beginning of COVID. I think we had about eight people, you said seven, but I'm always right, so it had to be eight. Uh, for the formal turnover and award ceremony. So I know it's hot, so I'm going to wrap up here. I want to pause and reflect a little bit on all that Jason has accomplished in 05. You heard the long list of accomplishments from Jim Downey during his speech, so I won't repeat those here. But I thought it would be appropriate to wrap up my sp speech by sharing some of the things that the CO5 staff shared with me. I'm going to just read these verbatim because it captures the essence of Jason, and I couldn't possibly say it any better. And I'll quote, and Jason referred to these other, there were three impactful sayings that speak to his ability to lead people and drive change. And you would hear these daily, usually more than once. Assume noble intent, his constant mantra. I'll describe it a little bit more. Everybody is trying to do their best, keep the ship's crew at the heart of the discussion, and most often a solution will be possible. One team, one fight. It was our true battle cry, and it really changed the old us versus them culture. And I really like the last reserve day for China and Russia constantly reminding the 05 team of the enterprise work that they do. This was modeled and taught early when his tenure, when as the 05 team would generally refer to the PEOs and PMs, having been one of those, as they. This approach absolutely broke them of the, of the bad habit, and I hope that, that will continue going forward. And finally, just a couple of testimonials from the workforce. I found these really moving. Uh, I won't tell you who wrote these, but one of, them, one of, the, one of the staff wrote to me, he's a truly selfless, people-centered leader, and he, one of the things I will never forget about Emma Lloyd that when as soon as he heard about the fact that I had lost electricity in a snowstorm, he called me and left a long message on my cell phone telling me that my two kids, my wife and I needed to go immediately to his house to stay until our power came back on. I've saved that message and have been, never been more grateful to be part of an organization where the leader walks the talk on always keeping his people first. Another story that may not rise to the level of Admiral Moore's speech, and whoever wrote this, I want to tell you, it absolutely does. But one that is meaningful to me is that Rare Malloy gave me his first coin because of my role in bringing him to CO5 from Norfolk. Given that we had work to work through IT issues, share drive issues, DTS switchover issues, we had worked hard to get it in as smoothly as possible. And I appreciated this first coin and have it on my home office as a reminder of his appreciation, which wasn't necessary because I was just doing my job. Now, if you need to know anything more about Jason, we can talk cold spray and we can talk out of manufacturing. 
I mean, I think those comments really kind of summarize who Jason was and the impact that he had on the 05 workforce. So, Tom, thank you for, for p passing those on to me and, and tell, tell the 05 team thank you so much for that. So let me close by thanking Dulcie, Chris and James and Kay. You can be very proud of what your father has accomplished, your son has accomplished, and I can tell you from working with him all these years that he is much prouder of what you've accomplished than anything he has done himself. Jason, thanks for being a great leader and a friend all these years. I know there will be a little bit of sadness in your heart today, but as my father told me when I retired, there really is no reason to be sad. You're leaving behind a great legacy, and there are a lot of Jason Lloyd trained people who will pick up that ball and continue to run with it in the direction you've set. The Navy will be in great hands for years to come. Fair winds and following seas, my friend. We'll miss you. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite Vice Admiral James Downey, Naval Sea Systems Command, to join Rear Admiral Lloyd, Dulcie, Kay, Chris, and James on center of the dais for a special presentation. Certificate of Appreciation from the United States Navy. To, to all who see these presents, greetings. To Dulcie, Kay, Chris, and James Lloyd. By the authority vested in me, it is my pleasure to express the grateful appreciation of the United States Navy. To you for your unselfish, patriotic, and devoted service during your husband's military career. Your unfailing support and understanding helped immeasurably to make possible his lasting contribution to the nation. To those who say a single man cannot make a difference, I say wrong. Your husband, son, and father did. He made our Navy stronger and kept our nation safe. With his service to the Navy now complete, he will be able to spend more time with you in the future. The United States Navy thanks you and I thank you given this 7th day of June, 2024, signed, J.P. Downey, Vice Admiral, United States Navy. Yes, please rise. Attention to award. The President of the United States takes pleasure in presenting the Legion of Merit Gold Star in lieu of fourth award to Rear Admiral Jason M. Lloyd, United States Navy, for service as set forth in the following citation. For exceptionally meritorious conduct and the performance of outstanding service as the Chief Engineer for Naval Sea Systems Command, Washington, D.C., from April 2020 to June 2024. Rear Admiral Lloyd displayed the highest sense of responsibility 
and leadership while enhancing fleet war fighting readiness and naval sea system commands responsiveness and wartime fleet support. Rear Admiral Lloyd delegated technical authority to the Waterfront Chief Engineers, empowering them to increase the scope of technical decisions and reducing the technical community's response time to fleet needs. Leveraging the comprehensive reviews following the USS McCain and the USS Fitzgerald Collision, Rear Admiral Lloyd drove improvements in safety for surface ship and submarine ship control systems. Designated ship control systems as safety critical and oversaw the development of standards, standardized ship control systems certification requirements. He teamed with the submarine industrial base and naval reactors to drive additive manufacturing to address critical defense industrial base liabilities and establish an afloat program of record which installs metal and polymer, polymer 3D printers on carriers, surface combat, and submarines. Rear Admiral Lloyd's superior performance of duties culminated his 34 years of honorable and dedicated military service by his dynamic direction, keen judgment, and loyal dedication to duty. Rear Admiral Lloyd reflected great credit upon himself and upheld the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. For the President, signed J.P. Downey, Vice Admiral, United States Navy. <laughs> yes, please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, Rear Admiral Jason Lloyd. So, thank you very much. It feels pretty good to be part of the retired list. Uh, my comments today my retirement comments today are solely focused on thanking you, the friends, family, and colleagues that have allowed the Lloyd family to serve this nation for so many years. Anything in life that you achieve comes down to two things that you can control and two things of chance. The two things you can control, choose to live with high moral values and have a hard work ethic. Things of chance stellar mentors and friends, as well as a whole lot of luck. Everything that I'm gonna to discuss today is in one of these categories. It's my sister in the front row. Our parents demanded high moral values from us and that we always do the best that we could do and never quit attitude. Mom, thank you. Dad, thank you. Wish you could be here. If they have DVDs in heaven, I'll send you a link. A great work ethic resulted in me being in a calculus course my senior year in high school. Only 15 people were allowed in that course um, when a Naval Nuclear Power Program recruiter came to talk to our class. The recruiter was lithographer first class, Daryl Caudell. Daryl, I had in my notes that he wasn't able to attend today, but he surprised me and came here last night. So thanks, Daryl. Appreciate it. So first time, who else has, maintains a friendship with the recruiter for 38 years? <laughs> So on 17 June 1986, Daryl took me to McGee Tyson Airport in Knoxville, Tennessee to start this 38 year journey. During the first week, I was selected the Port, port Watch Guide on. Fireman Keith Combs was selected to be the Port Watch Petty Officer. We became instant friends. We've been each other's best man. Um, and uh, we formed a friendship that has lasted forever. Thanks to the Combs family with their boys from being here. After starting the nuclear power program in 86, I finally graduated from prototype as an officer in 1993 and commenced a very rewarding career. While in this training pipeline uh, at nuclear power school, I sat beside Ensign Shannon Turhune and we became instant friends at that point in time. Thanks to Shannon and Melody for being here. Melody, I saw you over there. Thank you for coming. Our first ship, as Admiral Moore mentioned, was USS Bainbridge, CGN 25. And as he also mentioned, Captain Jim Brown, Rebel Scott Brown's father, was my captain. Master Chief Kirk Keller, my A-Gang LCPO, and Ian One Tom, Tom Yankley, I see you there, Tom, my LPO. Rich Horn and Captain Retired Nick Taylor were rounded out the golden boys on that awesome ship. As a testament to Jim Brown, Brown's leadership, and this is where leadership truly is. As a testament to his leadership, 
out of that boardroom, we made three flag officers, 19 captains, and one deputy reactor officer. At one time in 2014, Bainbridge Division officers held 50% of the reactor officer billets on the East Coast. I am the last of the boardroom, but Captain Jesse Black, the commanding officer of Naval Research Labs, is here with us today and was the second class petty officer at that time. Three other petty officers on that ship eventually made captain, and in January, along with Pete, Rear Admiral Brian Muddy was selected for flag officer, who was the second class petty officer on that ship at the time. So at that time, I called Brian and I said, all right, you win, and I, and I, can't, I can't last that long. Um, I left Bainbridge to pursue my master's degree in mechanical engineering and then postgraduate school, and I had lifelong friends that I met there, Admiral Tom Anderson and SES Mike McClatchy, who I still serve with today. Well, I did serve with them until about 15, 20 minutes ago. Um, retired Air, Captain Eric Wolper became instant friends. Thank you and Leah for coming today. After my principal assistant tour on Nimitz during RCOH, I went to begin my engineering duty officer tour at Norfolk Naval Shipyard. I was blessed to beat Rear Admiral Mark Hugel and Rear Admiral Mark Whitney and Captain Skip Huck, who all became mentors to help me guide through the remainder of my career. The Hugels and Whitneys are here with us today. Thanks for coming. Unfortunately, Skip was taken from us last year, far too early for a man who contributed so much to our Navy and nation. Thanks, Skip. <laughs> now I transition to AirPath, where I work for one of the strongest mentors, as Admiral Moore mentioned, who helped me transition from being a junior officer to a senior officer. Captain Peggy McCluskey, first aircraft carrier, female chief engineer, couldn't make it today, but she helped Dulcie and I through the remainder of our lives. As Admiral Moore mentioned, she and Bobby are sitting on the beach, sipping a Mai Tai, but they promised they were gonna be watching, so thanks. <laughs> when I was about 18 months, and I didn't see your notes at all, sir. When I was about 18 months into a 36 month tour at AirPack, the detailers contacted me and said, hey, we'd like you to be the new the next curricular officer at, at MPS, Naval Postgraduate School. What a job, your job is to supervise 30 lieutenants getting master's degrees. I mean, how hard can it be, right? <laughs> so Dulcie was really excited to get back to Monterey, um, and it was gonna be great, great for some downtime. Uh, while we were arranging this, Captain McCluskey got a call from her friend and confident at the time, Captain Tom Moore. Captain Moore, 3S, 3S 312 program manager, had an unexpected opening, and he had two prerequisites. Needed to be a senior commander, and needed to be a prior serve carrier chief engineer. Luckily for me, there were none of those types available in the Navy at the time, and Captain McCluskey assured Captain Moore that I was the right fit, and he graciously extended me an interview. At the end of the interview, as you mentioned, he offered me the job, and he said, do you have any questions? And I said, well, yes, sir. First, I pr I'll proudly announce that I've been penciled in as a curricular officer at NPS, and I was torn between the two jobs. His response, oh, Captain McCluskey gave me the impression you wanted to be a captain, not retire as a commander. <laughs> And then he said, yeah, you want to come work for me. What's your second question? <laughs> and I said, well, when do you want me to be there? And as he referenced, he came back immediately three weeks. I learned then to never leave an open question out there like that. <laughs> he imagined Dulcie's delight. She thinks we're going to Monterey after spending 18 more months in San Diego. And I went home and said, we're going to DC and I'm leaving in three weeks. And she was a trooper and uh, moved the kids. Um, by the way, in that San Diego tour, um, we moved four times. The fourth one moving back. Four times we moved, every one of them, I managed to be out of town on business. <laughs> She's a trooper. Um, it was absolute luck that I landed at PEO Carriers in 2006. It was the dream team of Naval leadership. Rear Admiral Mike McMahon, who's here with us, Captain Tom Moore at the time, future NAVC commander, Commander Jim Downey, PMS 3D, 378 Assistant Program Manager, future nav seat commander, Lieutenant Commander Phil Malone, PMS 312 Propulsion Engineer, future Major Program Manager, PMS 379, Lieutenant Jay Ramsey, an ILS intern, future Captain and Supply Officer, USS John F. Kennedy, I think Jay's here today too. Uh, GS 15 at the time, Bill DeLine, PMS 378 Executive Director, future Naval Sea Systems Commander. GS-15 Yao Fan, PMS-312 Principal Assistant Program Manager, future NAVC Executive Director. GS-15 Yiling Wang, 
CO5V and Service Engineering Director, future Major Program Manager for the USS Gerald R. Ford. How lucky do you have to be to be surrounded by a leadership team like that, right? Absolute luck and absolute mentors, every one of them. My next tour was at Supshit Newport News as the RCUH PMR and then CBN 78. I had the opportunity for working for Captain Kevin Terry. It was great. And I met a few junior officers that I would go on to mentor through the rest of their careers that have now turned into super powerful leaders. Lieutenant Joe Cloffer, Lieutenant Commander Hannah Cremo. At the time, both now captains. And leading from the front. I followed my soup ship tour with one of the best tours of my career. This was always tough. When people ask me what's the best tour, it's either CO5 or a reactor officer on Jordo 4. Both phenomenal tours. Um, here I fell into the second dream team of Naval leadership, starting with our commanding officer. Captain at the time, Oscar Meyer. Thanks for being here, Oscar. Oscar's a phenomenal leader who not only pulled the best out of his team, but he devoted an equal amount of time to developing him into leaders. The rest of dream team number two, we had Captain Beetle Bailey, executive officer, current rear admiral, Captain Paul Campagna, second executive officer, future commanding officer of USS Enterprise, Captain Matt Kawas, my relief is reactor officer, current rear admiral, commander Kristen Aquavella, first supply officer, current rear admiral, commander Julie Trainer, second supply officer, current rear admiral, commander Mike Bryant, the world's only deputy reactor officer in history. Lieutenant Commander Joe Cloffer, first main propulsion assistant, eventual captain, and eventual reactor officer on USS John F. Kennedy. Lieutenant Commander Mike Walters, reactor maintenance officer, and now a current uh, Amazon shipping franchise owner. Lieutenant Commander Shannon Fowler, reactor training assistant, current commander. Lieutenant Commander Meredith Warner, legal officer, now retired commander. Lieutenant Bethany Gillen, Reactor Controls Division Officer, now a nurse who happens to be a qualified nuclear engineer with the CO8 coin for crushing the engineer's exam. She just wasn't challenged enough with being a qualified nuclear engineer. She had to go be a nurse for a second career. And thanks for coming. I won't see you out there, but I will come see you. There's a hand. Hey, it's great to have you here. Um, Lieutenant Matt Murdoch, Reactor Controls Division Officer, current Commander Slack. Matt's here also. Chief Derek Meyer, M Division Chief and now retired Senior Chief, and the best for last. Lieutenant Emily Curran. Where are you, Emily? There she is. Lieutenant Emily Curran. A Division Officer and future First Reactor Electrical Assistant, USS John F. Kennedy. By the way, last week, Lieutenant Commander Curran graduated from MIT with two master's degrees in a two year period, where she also managed to raise her two kids that she had had the previous tour and have another baby while she was there. While her husband simultaneously taught at surface warfare officer school full time and they got a house in between the two and both community. So uh, Emily, hats off. Um, rest of you, uh, keep your eyes out. We got a power couple in the house. One story that always stood out with me was when uh, Captain Meyer set up our first department head me training meeting. Uh, is Commander Warner here? He's here. She set up the first department head training meeting, and uh, so he wanted to get us to figure out as a department heads how we could work together to better advance our crew. And Commander Warner, Commander Warner was the legal officer, and she was the first to go. The title of her presentation never made me laugh harder. What legal can do for you, and what legal can do to you. <laughs> Meredith, thanks for coming. Let's see you out there. While on Ford, I also got to work with some of the best leadership I'd ever had the honor to serve with as we wrestled together through a very tough test and certification program. Karen and Mark Kenneberger, Bill Chestnut, Steve Fisher, Alexis Quinn, Emily Gunlicky, Aaron Bell, Claire Atzer, Will Noel, Mark Dickinson, Andy Dudenhofer from CO8 were all instrumental in success of Team Ford, and I all count every one of those as dear friends. After leaving Ford in a short stint working for Andy Dudenhofer and Karen Hinneberger at Naval Reactors, we had to try to, um, try to figure out how we destroyed two turbine generators, I went back to work for Admiral Moore as a ZA. Here I work with Dream Team number three. I'll tell you the reason I'm here is because of the people I've been surrounded by and the people I've learned from. Dream Team number three. Most of them are on Dream Teams one and two, so I'm not going to mention the, the names again, but add to them where Admiral Brian Antonio, P.O. Cares. Rear Admiral Bill Galinas, PO Ships, and eventual NAVC Commander. 
Lieutenant Aaron, Aaron Stetson, now Commander. Lieutenant Will Day, who's with us, uh, now Lieutenant Commander. Mr. Jim Smirtansky taught me my best lesson ever, assume double intent. I still use it daily. Now everybody on my team knows where I got it from. It's the mantra of every engineer in NAVC 05 and in our field activities. After taking command at Suchet Newport News, I learned more about teaming with private industry counterparts to achieve mutually exclusive goal of providing the fleet with the platforms and weapon systems that the warfighter needs to deter war if possible and to fight and win if necessary. There are too many people to recognize here, so I'll just hit the wave tops with Captain Crewall, Captain Biggs, Captain Jason Massey, Steve Hedgepath, Mary Cullen, Dave Bolcar, Charles Southall, Kerry Molisco, Jerry Sazio, and Mike Riley. Thanks for coming. I already hit everyone in the CO5 and headquarters team, so I won't go over them again. I, I was deeply honored to work with everyone. So finally, to the personal relationships that provided the glue to our family to navigate 13 different duty stations, 14 different moves. First of all, my very close friends on the Rogue Velo cycling team, Eric Crandall and I started this team in our kitchen table in Chesapeake when we were 2011, and we formed lifelong relationships with Donna Wolf, Gordon and Ann Van Hook, Jerry Hadley, Tom Vaccara, Eric and Donna Crandall. Non-cycling friends, I mentioned the Combses and Jen Swain also. Thank you for coming. Life always comes full circle, so it's appropriate to loop around to my family who have made this journey with me, most in body, but all in spirit. By the time, every time the wind blows, I think, I think of Dad. Yeah, he's up there controlling everything, right man? My mom and Dad, thank you for giving us the opportunities to excel in life. You both love hard, but you demanded from us strong work ethic. You set the foundation for success, happy and loving professionals, spouses and parents. My sister, Lisa Lloyd Faulkner, and her husband, John. Lisa, you're my best friend and you have been since we were young. Life has thrown you and John more curveballs in the past few years than anyone should have to deal with. But I'm proud of how you hold your head high and continue to persevere. I'll always be here for you out there in TV land uh, watching. I love you, brother. Our youngest son, Corporal James Lloyd. I am beyond proud of the man that you have grown into. Watching you graduate from Paris Island and, get, and having you give me the honor of promoting you to Corporal are the highlights that I remember most right now. I'm confident there are many more events to come. I look forward to watching you to continue to grow and excel in everything you decide to do. Our oldest son, Chris, is here with his girlfriend, Alan. I'm beyond proud of the man that you've become. Serving you, seeing you virtually graduate from VMI and set out to develop a career to, to conquer um, has been very rewarding for me. If you need a real estate mogul in Hampton Roads, there's your man. Chris, continue to live and love life to the fullest. All right, I have not needed any tissues yet. Finally, my loving and beautiful wife, Dulcie. <laughs> I know I haven't been easy to love. You are the rock behind raising two perfect sons and still doing everything in your power to support me as I try to do my best for our Navy, our nation, and most importantly, our sailors. I am so looking forward to our trip to England with mom to visit her brother. I'm looking forward to our Venice to Venice Riverboat cruise in September. I'm looking forward to our morning coffee, knowing that a phone call from Will Noel or Eric Duncan will not be coming. <laughs> I'm looking forward to spending time together, taking a deep breath, and then deciding where we will best serve our country in the next chapter of life. There's a lot more to come. Fair winds and following seas to all of our family, friends, and mentors. We couldn't have done it without you and wouldn't have wanted to. I'll leave you with the same five final thoughts that should be controlling you over the next years. If you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. Always assume noble intent. The only time you're allowed to say they is if you're talking about China or Russia. One team, one fight, go Navy, beat China. Thank you.
Flag on a guard. Post. Ladies and gentlemen, the ceremony you are about to witness honors our nation's most cherished symbol of freedom, the stars and stripes. The flag will ceremoniously be passed from one sailor to the next in the honor guard formation. I am the flag of the United States of America. My name is Old Glory. I fly atop the world's tallest buildings. I stand watch in America's halls of justice. I fly majestically over great institutions of learning. I stand guard with the greatest military power in the world. Look up and see me. I stand for peace, honor, truth, and justice. I stand for freedom. I am confident. I am arrogant. I am proud. When I am flown with my fellow banners, my head is a little higher, my colors a little truer. I bow to no one. I am recognized all over the world. I am worshiped. I am saluted. I am respected. I am revered. I am loved and I am feared. I have fought in every battle of every war for more than 200 years. Gettysburg, Shiloh, Appomattox, San Juan Hill, the trenches of France, the Argonne Forest, Anzio, Rome, the beaches of Normandy, Guam, Okinawa, Tarawa, Korea, Vietnam, the Persian Gulf, and its scores of places long forgotten by all, except by those who were there with me. I was there. I led my soldiers and Marines. I followed them. I watched over them. They loved me. I was on a small hill on Iwo Jima. I was dirty, battle-worn and tired, but my sailors and Marines cheered me, and I was proud. I was at Ground Zero in New York City on September 11th as cowardly fanatics attacked America. I was raised from the ashes of once proud buildings by brave firefighters, heroes who risked their lives to save others, showing all that America, although bloodied, will never be beaten. Those who would destroy me cannot win, for I am the symbol of freedom, of one nation, under God, indivisible with liberty, and justice for all. I have been soiled, burned, torn, and trampled on the streets of my own country. And when it is by those whom I have served with in battle, it hurts. But I shall overcome, for I am strong. I have slipped the surely bonds of earth. And from my vantage point on the moon, I stand watch over the uncharted new frontiers of space. I have been a silent witness to all of America's finest hours. But my finest hour comes when I am torn into strips to be used as bandages for my wounded comrades on the field of battle. When I fly half mass to honor my soldiers and when I lie in the trembling arms of a grieving mother at the graveside of her fallen son or daughter, I am proud. My name is Old Glory. Long may I wave. Dear God, long may I wave. I will now read the Navy White Cover. 
While her sailor answered the call from the sea, she stood on the shore, fighting down the fear that he would not return. In his absences, she has had to deal with car repairs, home maintenance, financial worries, children's injuries, and illness. All these and more she has taken in stride so that her sailor could proudly serve our nation. Today, the side boys are posted and the boatswain stands ready to pipe. And as she has for so many years, a sailor's wife stands waiting on the shore. Soon the pipe will sound and her sailor will come ashore for the last time. His watch stands relieved, so too does hers. I will now read the watch. For 38 years, this sailor has stood the watch. While some of us were in our bunks at night, this sailor stood the watch. While some of us were in school learning our trade, this shipmate stood the watch. Yes, even before some of us were born into this world, this shipmate stood the watch. In those years when the storm clouds of war were seen brewing on the horizon of history, this shipmate stood the watch. Many times he would cast an eye ashore and see his family standing there, needing his guidance and help, needing that hand to hold during those hard times. But still, he stood the watch. He stood the watch for 38 years. He stood the watch that we, our families, and our fellow countrymen could sleep soundly in safety each and every night, knowing that a sailor stood the watch. Today we are here to say, shipmate, the watch stands relieved, relieved by those you have trained, guided, and led. Yeah, you are relieved. We now stand the watch. Postman, stand by to pipe the side. Shipmates going ashore. Guests, please rise for the benediction and remain standing for the conclusion of the ceremony and the departure of the official party and their families. The benediction is given for the purpose of sending the honoree off with a blessing. Uh, bow your heads. Today's benediction will be found in the Old Testament book of Numbers in chapter 6. Moses' words say, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Lord, we're asking blessing on the Lloyd family, Jason, Dulcy, Christopher, Lord, James, Kay, and the entire extended family. May you give them peace. Lord, we also ask that you would bless Admiral Small as he leads his family as they share him with our nation. And Lord, may you bless the Navy, its sailors, officers, and families, and may God bless the United States of America. Amen. Boston, post the side, boys. Following the time-honored naval tradition, Rear Admiral Lloyd now requests permission from Vice Admiral Downey to go ashore for the final time.
Rear Admiral, United States Navy retired, and family departing.